Do that again today. If this is accurate, then they highlight the complete failure to adhere to due process. One should not diminish the significance of impeachment's legal aspects, particularly as they relate to the formalities of the criminal justice process. It is a hybrid of the political and legal, a political process moderated by for legal formalities. This is a quote Richard brought to The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution provides, in relevant part, that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The Supreme Court long ago recognized in Matthews versus Eldridge that at its core, due process is about what we all want, what we all have the right to demand, fundamental fairness. One scholar, Brian Owsley, has written that the impeachment process should and does include some of the basic safeguards for the accused that are observed in a criminal process, such as fairness, due process, presumption of innocence, and proportionality, basic American values. And of course, we know that the Supreme Court has recognized that due process protection attend congressional investigations. While Congress is empowered to make its own rules of proceeding, it may not make rules ignore, that ignore con constitutional restraints or violate fundamental rights. Excuse me. While the case law is limited in terms of spelling out what due process looks like in impeachment hearings, and of course in the Nixon case, Walter, not Richard, we know that there's a great deal of leeway afforded Congress with respect to its impeachment rules. It is clear that the fundamental principles that underlie our understanding of what due process must always look like apply. In Hastings versus United States, DC court case, reversed, vacated on different grounds, they addressed the matter clearly concluding that the Due Process Clause applies to impeachment proceedings and that it imposes an independent constitutional constraint on how the Senate exercises its sole power to try all impeachments under Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6. Court wrote in Hastings, impeachment is an extraordinary remedy. As an essential element of our constitutional system of checks and balances, impeachment must be invoked and carried out with solemn respect and scrupulous attention to fairness. Fairness and due process must be the watchword wherever a branch of the United States government conducts a trial, whether it be in a criminal case, a civil case, or a case of impeachment. A 1974 Department of Justice memo suggested the same view, opining that, quote, whether or not capable of judicial enforcement, due process standards would seem to be relevant to the manner of, manner of conducting an impeachment proceeding. More specifically, as the Hastings Court described it, one of the key principles that lies at the heart of our constitutional democracy. Again, fairness. The Supreme Court precedents establish the general rule, rule that individuals must receive notice and an opportunity to be heard before the government deprives them of a constitutionally protected interest. It is also true that in any proceeding that may lead to deprivation of a protected interest, it requires fair procedures commensurate with the interests at stake. Impeachment proceedings plainly involve deprivations of property and liberty interests protected by the Due Process Clause. And the House surely seeks to strip Donald Trump of his most highly cherished constitutional rights, including the right to be eligible to hold public office again, should he so choose. Due process must apply, and at a minimum, due process in the impeachment process must include that the evidence must be disclosed to the accused and the accused must be permitted an opportunity to test and confront the evidence, particularly through the rights to confront and cross-examine witnesses, which have long been recognized as essential to due process. In almost every setting where important decisions turn on questions of fact, due process requires an opportunity to confront and cross-examine. It is unfathomable that the framers, steeped in the history of Anglo-American jurisprudence, would create a system that would allow the chief executive and commander-in-chief of the armed forces to be impeached based on a process that developed evidence without providing any of the elementary procedures that the common law developed over centuries for ensuring the proper testing of evidence in an adversarial process. We would never countenance such a system in this country.
Current members of the House and Senate leadership are themselves on record repeatedly confirming these procedural due process requirements. Indeed, Congressman Nadler is on record asserting that in the context of a House impeachment investigation, due process includes, quote, the right to be informed of the law, of the charges against you, to call your own witnesses, and to have the assistance of counsel. Then President Trump was not given any semblance of the due process Congressman Nadler clearly believes he deserves, based on the Congressman's description of due process that must be afforded to an accused in an impeachment proceeding, as reflected in a statement he made relating to another impeachment in 1998. No reason was found for the apparent change in the Congressman's point of view with respect to the two objects of the impeachment at issue. These fundamental attributes of due process have been honored as required parts of modern impeachment protocol since at least 1870. It's not seriously debatable, nor should it be, nor should it be by any American legislator. In spite of all this, the House leadership defied all the norms and denied the then president all of his basic and constitutionally protected rights. For then president Donald Trump, the House impeachment procedure lacked any semblance of due process, whatever. It simply cannot be credibly argued to the country and we do not make special rules for different targets. It's the very integrity of the institution that suffers when we do, and that is what the House leadership knowingly has caused. A review of the House record reveals that the Speaker streamlined the impeachment process. House Resolution 24 to go straight to the floor for a two-hour debate and a vote without the ability for amendments. The House record reflects no committee hearing, no witnesses, no presentation or cross-examination of evidence, and no opportunity for the accused to respond or even have counsel present to object. As the New York Times recently reported, there were no witness interviews, no hearings, no committee debates, and no real additional fact-finding. House managers claimed the need for impeachment was so urgent that they had to rush the proceedings with no time to spare for a more thorough investigation, or really any investigation at all. But that claim is belied by what happened or didn't happen next. The House leadership unilaterally and by choice waited another 12 days to deliver the article to this Senate to begin the trial process. In other words, the House leadership spent more time holding the adopted article than it did on the whole process leading up to the adoption of the article. That intentional delay, designed to avoid the, having the trial begin while Mr. Trump was still president, led to yet another egregious denial of due process. Article 1, Section 3 of our Consti uh, Clause 6 of our Constitution, of course, provides in pertinent part that the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. And when the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. By intentionally waiting until President Trump's, President Trump's term of office expired before delivering the article of impeachment to the Senate to initiate trial proceedings, Speaker Pelosi deprived then-President Trump of the express constitutional right and the right under the Senate's own Rule 4 to have the Chief Justice of the United States preside over his trial and wield the considerable power provided for in the rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials. That power includes, under Rule 5, the presiding officer's exclusive right to make and issue all orders, under Rule 7, to make all evidentiary orders, subject to objections by a member of the Senate. We say respectfully that this intentional delay by Speaker Pelosi, such that in the intervening period, President Trump became private citizen, Mr. Trump, constitutes a lapse or waiver of jurisdiction here. For Mr. Trump no longer is the President, described as subject to impeachment in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6, and in Article 2, Section 4. And this body, therefore, has no jurisdiction as a function of that additional due process violation by Speaker Pelosi. Moreover, with all due respect, then-President Trump suffered a tangible detriment from Speaker Pelosi's actions, which violates not only his rights to due process of law, but also his expressed constitutional right to have the Chief Justice preside. That tangible detriment includes the loss of the right to a conflict-free, impartial presiding officer, with all due respect, the very purpose behind requiring the Chief Justice 
to preside over the president's impeachment trial, along with the other benefits of having the two branches combined, Chief Justice from the Judiciary and the Senate, for the impeachment trial of the president reflected in Federalist 66, one of the reasons the Chief Justice was chosen for that task. Mr. Trump now faces a situation in which the presiding officer will serve as both judge with all the powers that the rules endow him with and juror with a vote. And beyond that, the presiding officer, although enjoying a lifelong honorable reputation, of course, has been Mr. Trump's vocal and adamant opponent throughout the Trump administration, and in fact, in the very matter on trial, the presiding officer, respectfully, already has publicly announced his fixed view before hearing any argument or evidence that Mr. Trump must be convicted on the article of impeachment before the Senate, and indeed, that members in both parties have an obligation to vote to convict as well. Nowhere in this great country would any American, and certainly not this honorable provided, presiding officer, consider this scenario to be consistent with any stretch of the American concept of due process and a fair trial, and certainly not even the appearance of either. By no stretch of the imagination could any fair-minded American be confident that a trial so conducted would or could be the fair trial promised by the leader. While most procedural aspects of the Senate impeachment trial may be non-justiciable political questions, this is not an excuse to ignore what law and precedent, precedent clearly require. The present situation either presents a violation of the constitutional text found in the articles mentioned above that require the Chief Justice to preside when the President is on trial, or it is a clear denial of due process and fair trial rights for private citizen Trump to face an impeachment trial so conducted by the Senate. The impeachment article should be treated as a nullity and dismissed based on the total lack of due process in the House. It should be dismissed because of Speaker Pelosi's intentional abandonment or waiver of jurisdiction, if the House ever acquired jurisdiction. And the article should be dismissed because the trial in the Senate of a private citizen is not permitted, let alone with the conflicts just described that attend this proceeding. Finally, on the subject of due process in this matter, I say the following. This is our nation's sacred constitution. It has served us well since it was written, and it's been amended only through a careful process. It is a document unique in all the world. It is a foundational part of what makes the United States a beacon of light among the other nations of the world. It not only has room for a tremendous variety of perspectives on the philosophical and political direction our country should take, it encourages the advocacy of our differences. But we have long held that fundamental to its health and well-being, and therefore to ours as a nation, is its insistence on due process for every citizen. The emphasis on the right to due process long ago was recognized as its life breath a primary guarantor of its eternal viability as our political, civic, and national guiding light. We all well know that there are many systems in other countries around the world that do not offer any semblance of the safeguards our constitutional concept of due process provides. Some of them have chosen their own handbooks, which direct their citizens' conduct on penalty of death. This is one of them. There can be no room for due process in such a system as this, or the system would be lost. Snap decisions are required in a system like this to maintain power for one political philosophy over all others in those kinds of systems. But we as a nation have rejected those systems and the kind of snap decisions they demand to maintain control for one party, for one point of view, and for an imposed way of life. We choose to live freely under a constitution that guarantees our freedom. Other countries fear those freedoms and seek to ensure adherence to a party line in all civic, political, spiritual, and other affairs, and to ensure that the party line is towed and those systems have no place for due process. Snap decisions that remove political figures are the norm. Maintaining their systems depend on it. That is not our way in America and never must be. 
We choose in America to live by our Constitution and its amendments and the due process this document demands for every citizen among us. By putting your imprimatur on the snap judgment made in this matter to impeach the President of the United States without any semblance of due process at every step along the way puts the office of the President of the United States at risk every single day. It is far too dangerous a proposition to countenance and you must resoundingly reject it by sending the message now that this proceeding, lacking due process from start to finish, must end now with your vote that you lack jurisdiction to conduct an impeachment trial for a former president whose term in office has expired and who is now a private citizen. So one reason you must send this message here and now is because of the complete lack of due process that brought this article of impeachment before this body. God forbid we should ever lower our vigilance to the principle of due process. An impeachment trial of a private citizen Trump held before the Senate would be nothing more nor less than the trial of a private citizen by a legislative body. An impeachment trial by the Senate of a private citizen violates Article 1, Section 9 of the United States Constitution, which provides that no bill of attainder shall be passed. The Bill of Attainder, as this clause is known, <clears throat> prohibits Congress from enacting a law that legislative deter legislatively determines guilt and inflicts punishment upon an identifiable individual without provision of the protections of a judicial trial. A Bill of Attainder is a legislative act which inflicts punishment without a judicial trial. A judicial trial. The distinguishing characteristic of a bill of attainder is the substitution of a legislative determination of guilt and legislative imposition of punishment for judicial finding and sentence. The bill of attainder clause in the separation of powers doctrine generally reflects the framers' concern that trial by a legislature lacks the safeguards necessary to prevent the abuse of power. As the Supreme Court explained in United States versus Brown, the best available evidence, the writings of the architects of our constitutional system, indicate that the Bill of Attainder Clause was intended not as a narrow, technical, and therefore soon to be outmoded prohibition, but rather as an implementation of the separation of powers, a general safeguard against legislative exercise of the judicial function. More simply, trial by legislature. The Bill of Attainder reflected the framers' belief that the legislative branch is not so well suited as politically independent judges and juries. When the Senate undertakes an impeachment trial of a private citizen, as it clearly understands to be the case here, supported by the facts that the Chief Justice is not providing and Mr. Trump is not the president, it is acting as a judge and jury rather than a legislative body. And this is exactly the type of situation that the Bill of Attainder constitutional provision was meant to preclude. It is clear that disqualification from holding future office, the punishment the House managers intend to seek here, is a kind of punishment, like a banishment and others, that is subject to the constitutional prohibition against the passage of bills of attainder, under which, under which general designation bills of pains and penalties are included. The cases include Cummings, Ex parte Garland, and this Brown case. The Supreme Court three times has struck down provisions that precluded support of the South or support of communism from holding certain jobs as being in violation of this prohibition. Thus, the impeachment of a private citizen in order to disqualify them from holding office is an unconstitutional act constituting a bill of attainder. Moreover, this is the exact type of situation in which the fear would be great that some members of the Senate might be susceptible to acting in the haste the House acted in when it rushed through the article of impeachment in less than 48 hours, acting hastily simply to appease the popular clamor of their political base, the very kind of concern expressed by Mr. Hamilton in Federalist 65. Moreover, as Chief Justice Marshall warned in Fletcher versus Peck, it is not to be disguised that the framers of the Constitution viewed with some apprehension the violent acts which might grow out of the feelings of the moment and that the people of the United States in adopting that instrument have manifested a determination to shield themselves and their property from the effects of those sudden and strong passions 
to which men and women are exposed. The restrictions on the legislative power of the states are obviously founded in this sentiment, and the Constitution of the United States contains what may be deemed a Bill of Rights for the people of each state. No state shall pass any Bill of Attender in this form. The power of the legislature over the lives and fortunes of individuals is expressly restrained. And so now let's turn to the text of the Constitution.